The atoms of our bodies and our very planet once gleamed in distant stars. stars and galaxies of our universe, an object that neither reflects nor casts light, that instead devours light. This object is a black hole. Some say that black holes are tunnels, stargates in time and space. Through such gates we might travel to the past. even distant parts of the universe. It has been said that other dimensions might exist within a black hole, or that we might find there another universe parallel to our own. Join us as we journey in a starship of our imagination beyond the visible universe as we search for black holes. that is our visible universe. They do not float at random, but are assembled in distinct groups called island universes. All of the stars visible to the naked eye belong to our own island universe, the galaxy of the Milky Way. Dr. Isaac Asimov tells us more about the galaxy. The galaxy is immense. Despite their enormous number, the stars in the galaxy are so far apart that light takes several years to get from one star to its neighbors. Light reaches the Earth from the Sun in approximately eight minutes, but requires 100,000 years to cross the entire galaxy. The nucleus of the galaxy glows with the light of 100 billion stars. Out of this nucleus trail spiral arms of dark dust and brilliant stars. Scientists believe that floating in space with these ordinary stars, these glowing balls of gas, are billions of tiny dark interlopers. Black holes in space and time. Scientific theory tells us that black holes are gravestones, phantoms that mark the death of stars. Stars, like people, are born, live for a time, and then eventually die. A great swirling cloud of gases and dust is the birthplace of a star. A star's stable lifetime is a balance between two forces. Thermal pressure pushing out on the star and gravitational pressure pushing in. 
eventually, no energy remains to fight the inward pressure of gravity. Massive stars then explode in a fiery supernova. The Veil Nebula is a remnant of one such titanic explosion. If the core of the supernova is very massive, it is doomed. Gravity overwhelms all other forces. The matter of the star is crushed out of existence as it collapses utterly. Vanishing into the baffling ruin known as a black hole. The gravitation of a black hole is so intense that even light cannot escape. All matter is drawn downward into the hole. How can we hope to see such a dark, uncommunicative object? Since the black hole itself is utterly black, we must observe the matter around it. Professor Kip Thorne, an astrophysicist at the California Institute of Technology, tells us how we might detect black holes. Roughly half the stars in the universe are in double systems. In such a system, two stars orbit around and around each other, each attracted by the gravitational pull of the other. One of those stars may be a black hole, and the other may be a normal star. When the normal star ages, it begins to expand, growing larger and larger, and beginning to dump gas onto its dark companion. That gas doesn't fall directly onto the companion. Rather, it swirls around and around the companion like water in a whirlpool, forming a gigantic accretion disk. That accretion disk has friction, some, such tremendous friction that it gets heated up to a temperature of 10 or 100 million degrees, and then shines forth brightly with x-rays into the external universe. To test this theory, astronomers needed observational evidence. The Titan II rocket lifted an x-ray satellite high above the Earth. Such x-rays have been seen recently with telescopes flown in satellites above the surface of the Earth, and we think those x-rays coming from an object called Cygnus X-1 are actually from gas around a black hole. We've seen one way to find a black hole, an x-ray source near a massive expanding star. Recent evidence suggests that an even larger black hole might be found at the very center of our galaxy. 30,000 light years from Earth, obscured by dust clouds, lies the hub of our galaxy. Deep within this hub is a dense cluster of millions of stars. Though the visible light of these stars is hidden to our telescopes, the infrared, or heat radiation, can shine through. Dr. Thomas Jabal may have found a black hole deep within this area. During the past few years, I and my colleagues at Berkeley, Professor Charles Towns and John Lacey, have been observing a line of neon coming from the interstellar gas at the center of our galaxy. And what we find is that this gas is moving at very high velocities, and particularly high velocities, very close to the center. Now, if the gas is responding to gravitational forces, that implies that at the very center of our galaxy, there is additional mass that is mass beyond what is in the form of stars. This mass could be in the form of a black hole of perhaps several million solar masses. We think we found a black hole at the center of our galaxy. Our belief in its existence depends on the behavior of matter around it. Professor George A. Bell of the University of California at Los Angeles will lead us out beyond the galaxies as we search for signals from even greater black holes. The nearest galaxy that we can see easily from the northern hemisphere is the famous Andromeda galaxy. But we see it as it was about two million years ago when light left it to begin its long journey across space to reach us.
Since light takes time to travel, the farther away a galaxy, the farther back in time we are looking. As we look deeper and deeper into distant space, more great clusters of galaxies are visible, stretching away beyond the reach of our greatest telescopes. Light reaching us from the farthest visible galaxies has been traveling for five billion years, one-third the age of the universe. Even beyond these galaxies lie objects trillions of times brighter than our sun, the quasars. Might these quasars and all their brilliance be another way to find black holes? At the James Lick Observatory, astronomers seek answers to the ancient riddle of the quasars. is man's opening to the universe, the portal through which his thought and imagination must pass to comprehend the heavens. Ray Bradbury gives us a personal view of astronomy. The question is asked constantly, why bother with astronomy, why bother with space at all, why bother with space travel? The question has to be answered in terms of immortality. In other words, we're curious about the stars, we're curious about the universe, because since we came out of the cave, since we developed our philosophy, we have worried about death, haven't we? We've had to imagine heavens for ourselves. And now suddenly, in the space age, a remarkable change has occurred in our thinking. We realize that if we succeed in the next 50 years, the next 100 years, the next 1,000 years, in crossing the void, we can build ourselves heavens instead of thinking about them. So our theologies will change. We will no, not have to promise people heavens. We can deliver them. We can deliver ourselves, our souls, our blood, our thoughts, our minds, to those heavens beyond our own particular part of the universe. The observation night has begun. Okay, Arlen, I'd like to set on the... Uh, An astronomer relays the position of his star to a night assistant on the dome floor. 13 hours, 54 minutes, moves across the night sky, balanced so delicately that a gimbal motor of one quarter horsepower drives it. In a reflecting telescope, like this three meter at Lake, Starlight is gathered by the large primary mirror and reflected to a smaller convex mirror at the top of the telescope. Light reflected by the convex mirror travels back down through a small hole in the center of the primary mirror. Here below the telescope, a diffraction grating spreads the light into a colorful spectrum which tells the astronomer about the nature and behavior of the cosmic gases he is observing. Average stars, like the sun, radiate mainly in the visible. Hot stars in the ultraviolet and cool faint stars in the infrared. Beyond the visible spectrum lie X-ray and radio waves. shines in all the wavelengths of visible light. Each element within the star has its own unique pattern of lines, which, like a fingerprint, enables us to identify that element wherever it occurs. Because chemical elements can be found in a star, 
The spectrum is our key to the universe. Spectral analysis led to an amazing discovery. Probably the first great cosmological discovery of the 20th century was that the galaxies are all moving away from us. We call it the law of the red shifts. It was discovered by Hubble in 1929. The red shift means that the spectral features, the lines, the features in the rainbow of colors you get when you spread the light out with a spectrograph are shifted to longer wavelengths. And this indicates motion away from us due to the so-called Doppler effect. The redshift indicates distance. The further away a galaxy, the further to the red its light is shifted. So quasars having among the largest redshifts of any of the objects known in the universe must be very far away out among the most remote galaxies and beyond galaxies that we can recognize as such. At the Palomar Observatory, Dr. Wallace Sargent shows us how optical astronomers measure the size of quasars. The most remarkable thing about quasars is that not only are they very distant, but they also seem to be incredibly small. We can measure their size because some quasars vary in the amount of light they produce. If a quasar brightens in one day, it couldn't be much larger than the distance light travels within this day. And this means that the energy that they're radiating must come from a, a region which is not more than a few light days across. This is only about a hundred times as large as the solar system, or much smaller than the distance from the sun to the nearest star. Quasars, then, are a riddle. How could a small star-like object be brighter than a trillion stars? What could power it? Dr. Tony Reedhead of the Owens Valley Radio Observatory tells us how another type of astronomy aids us in answering the riddle of the quasars. Stars, galaxies, and quasars emit not only visible light, but also longer wavelength radio waves. Radio observations led to the discovery of quasars in 1963. We use huge dishes to observe these radio sources deep in space. By synchronizing three radio telescopes in the United States, one in Germany, we can make very detailed maps of quasars with resolution equivalent to that of a telescope nearly as big as the Earth. With this resolution, you could measure the width of a human hair at a distance of three miles. This is a map of a distant quasar, 3C147. It has a very bright core in the center and a long, narrow jet on one side. Cambridge astronomers have looked at a nearby radio galaxy and found enormous amounts of energetic material on both sides of the galaxy. A more detailed map reveals a long jet plowing into intergalactic space. Observations on a scale a million times smaller again show a bright core and a one-sided jet, like we saw in the quasar. Somehow, the object in the center channels enormous amounts of material into a narrow jet. At the Goldstone National Observatory, Dr. Marshall Cohen has made further radio observations of quasars. Some quasars seem to explode every few years. By making a radio map of them once or twice a year, we can assemble a time-lapse movie of their activity. This quasar appears to consist of a very hot core, shown here in red, that does not change, and a cooler jet, shown in deep blue, that does change. Then we see what appear to be large, massive blobs of gas surging out of the nucleus and coming at us at near the speed of light. To propel such masses of gas that fast requires tremendous amounts of energy. 
The source of that energy would make the sun look weak. It would even make nuclear bombs look pale. No question that we're dealing with a very large explosion. What could liberate such fabulous energy? We know that nuclear energy is far, far too weak a source. Only gravitation can convert so much mass to energy in such a small place. But a single coherent object of immense gravitational energy is required. Where might we find nearby objects of such intense gravity? Dr. Peter Young may have found such an object in a nearby galaxy. We chose the galaxy M87 for our observations because it is the nearest giant galaxy with an energetic nucleus. An immense jet of gas comes out of the center. If a black hole at the center of M87 is causing this jet, we would expect stars in the center of the galaxy to be influenced. Observations confirm this idea. Stars near the center move more rapidly under the influence of a point mass equivalent to billions of suns. As the stars are pulled in by this mysterious mass, they crowd more closely and brighten the center of the galaxy. We believe this mass to be a supermassive black hole. The galaxy M87 is not a quasar but a quasar-like jet streams out of its center. How then does a black hole power a quasar? Scientists theorize that at the very center of a distant galaxy, a black hole more massive than a billion suns may be found. We've seen that matter from a massive expanding star can rotate around a black hole. A vastly larger, more energetic disk would be created around a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy. This disk is a violent churning cauldron of hot gas. Magnetic fields are twisted and stretched until the gas can no longer hold them. They erupt with light, releasing energy in violent beams. The electric and magnetic fields of the gas spread the black hole and are pulled around by it. These beams shoot into space at nearly the speed of light, visible to us as the bright jets of the quasars. We have found our culprit then, the murderer of the center of galaxies, a supermassive black hole. Perhaps up to half the matter it swallows can be converted to the stupendous display of energy that is a quasar. A beacon so unimaginably brilliant that it can be seen 15 billion light years distant by people in a universe 15 billion years older. What of the future? Our future? Could a black hole nibbling from within devour our entire galaxy? The answer is no. For our galaxy and M87 have survived for 15 billion years without ill effect. As the galaxy grows older, the massive stars sink slowly toward the center. While the lighter stars rise in an ever-expanding cloud of faint red dwarfs. But the unimaginably great distance between the stars and their agonizingly slow speeds bring a measured timelessness to this process. A galaxy can easily survive for hundreds, perhaps thousands of times the present age of the universe. Only a small fraction of stars near the center will be captured and destroyed by the whole. Our sun and its planets, orbiting the galaxy every 200 million years, 30,000 light years distant from the massive black hole that resides at the center, are removed forever from any danger. 
The presumed myriad of tiny stellar black holes, no larger than an average town, floating randomly among the common stars of our galaxy, pose a threat so negligible that should we survive for millions of ages of the universe, for thousands of trillions of years, we should still be safe from any close encounter with a black hole.